Stephen, please come on up and tell us just how wonderful things are in Canada compared to the rest of the world. I should say to the people that are staying at the back, there are plenty of seats over at the front if you prefer to, uh, to be seated. Um, so Anthony talked a bit about uh, headlines and news, and I, I should say for, for Canada, they did a poll for the Wall Street Journal and they asked, what's, what's the most boring headline in business that, that has been asked? And, and the winner was Worthwhile Canadian Initiative. So um, in terms of, in terms of the, the Canadian uh, story, I think it's always been interesting to be working on trade, but in Canada right now, what we're seeing in terms of uh, upside surprises to, to global growth, on the one hand, we've seen a much stronger global economy. The engine of, of trade is, is going well, and it's a sunny, sunny forecast, sunny outlook. Then on the other hand, we have these doom and gloom headlines and concerns about, well, maybe there's a chance of a, of a, of a global trade war. So I think sort of replicating all of that is, is interesting because I don't think anybody in, in terms of the headline business has ever asked, but what does this all mean for Canada? You don't see a lot of those stories. So that's, that's going to be, <laughs> no, no, not your fault. But I guess it's, it's sort of the burden of proof on me is to say that the Canadian story is actually interesting. It's always been interesting in Canada. Um, but when we have oil price shocks, which are hitting Canada differently than other economies, when we have the, the, the shocks to, uh, to global growth, um, I think that the story that we have to tell in Canada and the implications that has for our economy is, is useful for, uh, for what's going on um, elsewhere. So let me start. Then, as a small open economy, we are hit by shocks that are beyond our borders, and uh, we take very seriously what's happening in global growth. So let's think about the long period of time after the recession. We had, this is a forecast from, from the IMF, so I'm taking the, the, um, the World Economic Outlook, the dark blue line here is what actual growth was. The light blue lines are the forecasts. So in, in 2011, we had this rebound after the recession, and we thought, okay, well, growth is gonna pick up, so we'll be, you know, four, four and a half percent-ish. That didn't really turn out to happen. 2012, growth decelerated. But the idea then in 2012 was that, well, we'll get back there. Growth is going to pick up. And that didn't happen as well. And then the story was 2013. And we'd, five years in a row, we've had these kind of serial disappointments where global growth in the IMF's sort of forecast was, was for an acceleration. And then what happened was growth was slowing down. But uh, interestingly, all of that changed in the last two years. So in 2016 and 2017, we've actually been, for the first time in the, in the kind of post-crisis period, we've seen surprises on the upside. So that's good news, and that's having impacts for, for, the, for Canada's economy and, and what's, uh, what filters down to us. And if you want to understand the story of kind of where Canadian economy is going and, and some big impacts on that, I think the oil price shock is, is a good place to start. So about uh, the middle of 2014, just going to bring this one in here, we had oil that was running at about, was about $100 a barrel. In the space of 18 months, we went from $100 a barrel hitting a trough of 30. So that is a 70% decline in the price of oil. So for Canada, as a large producer, a large exporter of energy, this is a very big terms of trade shock. Uh, price of exports fell. This was a, an impact on our purchasing power internationally. And this is, this is a very big shock for a small economy. Uh, we had the central bank cutting interest rates and we had slower growth as a result. So I think the oil price shock and then the subsequent recovery is, is an important part of the story in what's diverging between the performance in Canada and the US in terms of where we're at in business cycles. So the oil price shock has obviously delayed Canada's recovery. This is a chart that shows output gap estimates, so where the economy is performing relative to its potential or capacity. And you see in red Canada and in blue the US. The US was obviously hit a little bit harder as the epicenter of that global financial crisis. But at mid-2014, before when oil prices were running about $100 a barrel, Canada and the US were both at about, let's say, 1.5% below their potential. So there was some excess supply, there was some slack, but it wasn't that big. Uh, what happened then in the oil price shock is that really pushed Canada away and farther and slowed us down, whereas the US increased uh, production and, and was getting closer and closer to its capacity, Canada was slowing down. Now, in part, you have to ask yourself, so what was driving the oil price shock? And most of the analysis that we've done and people have gone through is it's the shale play in the US. So we've seen a big increase in supply coming on, uh, and that's been, in, that's been a boon to the US economy, and that's been sort of a less, more of a mixed bag for Canada, let's just say. Um, so the poll now for you guys on Slido, if you're on the, on the, uh, the code there, we've got will the, will the recent rally in oil prices continue, yes or no? So we've seen oil breaking over $70 a barrel uh, just recently and some discussions about Iran and sanctions and what's happening there. So we've seen oil prices move up. I have 40 people that have responded and we're, people are kind of thinking yes. Well, if so, 
That'd be a good news for Canada. Uh, one of the things that we've seen is, is there's been a gap open up between the global prices, and this is the world West Texas or Brent, Tex uh, uh, Brent prices, or what Canada's getting, or, or WCS for, for oil sands uh, production. So there's been a gap opening up, and Canada has benefited, but not as much as we otherwise would have, uh, given the differences on prices. Okay, so I'd like to tell the story here about Canada's economy in four phases over the last decade. So we had this period, I talked about this global disappointment where we had obviously the big financial crisis, and then we had some slow, slow kind of, we're gonna get back there, we're gonna get back there, we think that the economy will recover. Um, we had the double dip in, in Europe and concerns about um, how solvent banks would be and, and government kind of interrelations there. And then for Canada, we had this oil price shock, and that has really slowed down growth. There was a big debate, um, at least in the blogosphere that I follow in, in the Canadian side of Twitter, about whether or not there had been a, a recession in Canada over this period of time. So it's a very concentrated shock. It's hitting, uh, let's say, 10% of the economy, but it's, it's a very, very big hit to that economy. So the, the oil price shock had slowed us down to the point where there was, there was actually no growth at that point in time. And then, this is mirroring very much what's happening in global markets. We had these upside surprises. So in 2016 and 2017, in Canada, growth picked up, uh, and picked up in a way that most economists had not expected was going to happen. And now, if you want to know what our forecast is going forward, is because we've seen growth accelerate beyond the level of sort of sustainable potential, we see Canada's growth uh, slowing back in there around, let's say, 2% 2 or so in the next couple of years. So we've had growth, it was around 1.5% in 2017, doubled to 3% growth in, uh, in 20, sorry, 2016, doubled to 3% last year, and we see growth around 2% 2, 2 or so going forward. So what I'm gonna do is kind of fill in the details now for that chart and explain to you what are some of the drivers of, of the Canadian economy in terms of uh, the composition. So I'll go through the labor markets, consumption, housing, uh, investment, and, and, and try to fill the story out that way. So on the labor market side, we'll start with the unemployment rate, and we've seen the unemployment rate in Canada. It went up from, we had 6% pre-crisis, spiked up to 9% nationally, and then you see it sort of monotonically declining over time. A slight uptick there, um, starting in, in mid-2014 when oil prices turned. And if, you, if we sp split this out now, so in Canada, oil production is, is concentrated geographically in Alberta and Saskatchewan and, and Western Canada, and uh, eastern, uh, off, off the uh, coast of, uh, of Newfoundland in the east. So in those areas, when you bring those together, look at the unemployment rates there, you'll see a very different story. So this is the dark, uh, the dark black line here. We see that generally the unemployment rate in labor markets were better in the energy economies uh, in terms of the oil producers in Canada. The dynamics come down there, but in 20, sort of 2015, we see this, this very big spike from around 5% up to 9% unemployment rate. So the unemployment rate in the oil producing economies basically doubled at that point in time. But if we, if we separate out central Canada, so this is, this is uh, Quebec and Ontario, west and British Columbia, the rest of Atlantic Canada, they just more or less kind of continue on their way. So there's a very big concentrated shock here in terms of labor market impacts. But in 2017, after we'd adjusted to this oil price shock from 2014, Bank Canada had cut interest rates. On the labor market side of things, we saw something similar to what happened in, in the US jobs report. So the first Friday of the month, the jobs reports come out, and our economists will be making predictions on what we're gonna see. And in 2017, kind of month after month after month, the growth, particularly now here, I'm showing now full-time employment, but we had the most, um, biggest improvement in terms of employment in a decade, We're looking at that last chart there, 2017. And the important part of that being full-time employment is these are quality jobs, these are good jobs. People are taking money, they're spending money, they're buying cars, they're moving into houses, those kind of things, so it's being spread throughout the economy. Um, I'm gonna turn now to consumption and housing, and so the labor market strength is supported consumption and consumption has, has held up pretty well. We had the strong labor markets, we've had, um, essentially the government had changed over in 2016, so there was a, a government that became more expansionary, they cut middle income, income tax rates were, were reduced, and there was a large increase in transfers to, to uh, households that had children. So that, that started happening in 2016, and that was something which supported consumption. And of course, another reason why consumption had kept going was because interest rates in Canada, as well as in the US, are at historic low rates. So they were sort of encouraging people to, to take out mortgages to buy long-lived assets, and they did. Uh, and as a result of people borrowing to purchase long-lived assets, like housing, household debt in Canada has accumulated. So we've seen household debt go, this I'm, I'm showing you now from 1990 all the way up until 2017. 
Um, and, and at this point now, when we look at comparables to the U.S., we're, we're at a, a higher level. So for every dollar of personal disposable income in Canada, there's $1.72 now in terms, of, uh, in terms of debt levels for households. That's a very high number. And people are concerned, A, about if we start increasing interest rates, will these households be, uh, be sort of cut off? Will they choke off their consumption? Uh, that's, that's something that, that people are worried about. Um, let me see if I want to say anything else on this chart. No, that was basically, this is, we've, we've seen a big increase in, in terms of the level of, of debt in the economy, and that is something that people are keeping an eye on for, for monetary policy um, concerns. So on that side, we had an improvement, or we had a, a deterioration in terms of mortgage debt, so people were taking out larger mortgages. On the asset side, housing prices have increased and have increased and increased. So the, the net situation of households was not actually uh, all that much worse. But there may be, with interest rates being low, we may be pushing towards, is there a housing bubble? So on the housing imbalance side, uh, at EDC Economics, we estimate on a monthly basis that sustainable level of starts is somewhere around 185,000, uh, which would be some, somewhere roughly about one-tenth of what it would be uh, in the US. And so what we've seen starts do here, uh, this is the blue line coming in, very different between Canada and the US. So in Canada, we didn't have that overbuild. So there was a very, very big increase in, in uh, housing markets in, in the US prior to the crisis, and that didn't happen in Canada. So we did see some excitement, some froth, uh, starts up to almost 300,000 on a monthly basis. But the difference between Canada and the US is that we didn't really overbuild, and so the reduction, while, while important from about 300 down to 100, there's a very big drop, it was very short-lived. So it was, it was essentially, in 2000, 2009, builders stopped building. And then, they, then housing markets turned around and people kind of came back on. So we've seen over time starts running a little bit above demographic demand in Canada. And so if we accumulate this up over the business cycle now that we have today in terms of the overall level of supply in, in Canadian housing markets through, through starts, and what we see is more kind of sustainable demand, we think that there may be overbuilding or there may be, may be more building than, uh, than long run sustainability can, uh, can allow for. On the, on the housing market side, as I mentioned, we've seen a big increase in prices, and so regulators at both the provincial levels uh, have, have stepped in, and, uh, as well as at the federal level. So tighter mortgage rules have come in place, and that has been uh, working to slow prices. This is a chart of the annual price growth in housing markets in, in Canada. So you saw the big impact of the recession coming back after that, and the improvement in housing markets really taking place through 2016 and 2017. So what happened initially, we have uh, the two major biggest cities in Canada, in Toronto and in Vancouver. Housing prices increased, uh, especially in the high-end homes, over a million dollar homes, uh, increased a lot. So provincial regulators in, uh, implemented a foreign buyer's tax, first in Vancouver. So there was concerns about money coming in offshore, mainly from China, going into, into the Vancouver market. So Vancouver first implemented a 15% foreign buyer's tax. Then we saw pricing appreciation move over into the central market in Toronto and money coming from, from Asia into Toronto, and then the provincial regulators in Toronto implemented their own foreign buyer's tax. We sort of had money moving from one side to another, uh, large appreciation of, of housing prices in those two markets. And then on top of that, uh, we've implemented in 2018 some new mortgage uh, requirements, so they're much stricter. Uh, this is trying to avoid what happened in, in the run-up in the U.S. market. So now, even if you're on a, a variable mortgage or a fixed mortgage, uh, the requirement is that, that you meet whatever the current rate is plus 200 basis points. And so that's a bit more stringent uh, federally, which came in. And as a result of that, we saw some, some housing purchases that were pulled forward. So when this announcement was made, there was a sort of scurry for people to get, it, to get in, the, in the market before it wrapped up. And then in, in 2018, we really have seen the Canadian housing market, in terms of resales, slow quite a lot. And housing prices have, have slowed considerably as well. So the poll question for you, if you're, if you're following the Canadian housing market uh, very quickly or very closely, would be, uh, is Canada's housing market in for a soft landing? As many economists are looking at housing price sort of slowing down, or are we in potentially for a, a bubble territory and, and a, a burst? So I'd say the consensus view in Canada has been that regulations have, have, uh, are a better instrument than monetary policy to affect these changes. And so the sort of financial regulations that we've implemented have been, have been sound and will slow the market, but the question is whether that will slow the market considerably and almost sort of too much. Um, it's looking like we've got soft landing vote territory from 64 people, so uh, that's good news for Canada, as well as the, the oil price stuff, so I guess you guys are optimistic. Uh, thank you for that. We'll go to my next slide after this. Okay, so let me talk now a little bit about fiscal policy in Canada. So here we had uh, three regimes, and I want to kind of walk you through what's happened over the last decade. 
Fiscal policy most recently has shifted from a period in Canada where there was a focus on balancing the budget, so reducing spending in order to balance the budget, and then now we've gone from a, a shift from a, a conservative right of center government before 2015. The liberals that are sort of center or left of center ran on a platform uh, explicitly stating that they were not going to balance the budget of the other parties wanted to. They said that they would not, and they would increase spending on things like infrastructure and that the transfers to households and things I talked about before. That was the game plan, and, and that's what they're doing. So this, is, this shows you the growth rate of government spending uh, over this last period. The first period of stimulus was, was the one in 2008 and 2009 in Pittsburgh at the G7 summit where Canada was a partner with, with the rest of the G7. Uh, the story was going to be that we were in a hole and we needed fiscal policy to, to help us offset uh, some of the, the problems that we were in. Increases in infrastructure, increases in transfers to state and local governments so they could increase spending. And we saw that period. And that period came for two budgets. And then after that, federally, in Canada, we were in deficit. And the worry was, maybe this deficit won't be closed anytime soon. Uh, revenues are slow because we had these sort of serial disappointments on the revenue side. So we need to restrain spending. And so that's what happened federally. And the story I told you, again, in, in 20, at the end of 2015, a liberal government won. And they came in on more of a much more expansionary uh, fiscal, fiscal uh, policy state. And so we've seen, uh, on the one hand, consumption and, and household spending driving growth in, in the Canadian economy. But now it's being uh, supported much more by fiscal policy. Let me turn now to investment, which I think is also an interesting story, thinking about what's going on in terms of uncertainty and whether there is adequate uh, production and, and interest in terms of let's, let's increase our investment now because we see demand coming forward. And so let me take, take you to a few of those uh, charts. First, this is a capacity utilization rate in Canada. So I'll show you again, I'm going to do everything from 2007 on to, on to now, and, and you look at where we were before the last recession. We were at about 86% at an aggregate level, and where we're at right now is, is the highest level in about a decade. So we're back to that point. Uh, you see that slowdown from the oil price and then this big, this big rebound in, in 2017. This is at the aggregate level, and when we go through more detailed sector-by-sector sector, uh, comparisons, we see that a lot, of, a lot of sectors in Canada are running right near capacity. So where, they, where they've been over the last 10 years, they're right at kind of their threshold. Um, and a lot of those are in the trade intensive sectors. So we've seen things like um, on transportation equipment, wood, pulp and paper, chemical, lots of things that are moving across borders, they're at their threshold. And so the question is, is there a desire now to increase investment to meet that demand? Or are people kind of sitting on the sidelines, hesitating and waiting because they're not sure about trade rules? So if I overlay now from my capacity utilization rate in blue and I bring in investment in red, uh, we see the very big hit that an investment took, so going below zero, so falling kind of off a cliff essentially in 2015. So energy prices, energy production in Canada is about, let's say, 10% of GDP, but it was accounting for over a third uh, of investment at, at the peak in terms of these, they're very uh, energy in intensive, capital intensive uh, pipeline projects and other things. So that fell off and that reduced business investment in Canada considerably. And when you look at capacity utilization rates which, which have increased, that would lead you to believe that we're going to see investment returning. And that's been uh, kind of slow but sure. We're now above the zero point, so investment is growing. But it's not growing as quickly as I think people would, would have expected uh, given where we're at in the cycle. And the story for that may be one of uncertainty. So I think other people have talked about um, searches for protectionism or what's going on in, in terms of policies and, and, and uh, Trump and other things. So this obviously impacts us in, in Canada. So let me start here first with the Global Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. Uh, so Nick Bloom and some co-authors have done some very interesting and very good work to look actually through newspaper articles. And what they do is they do searches to go for keywords including economic policy and uncertainty. And they try to quantify these things over time to get a sense of, so what was the, what was the bigger, uh, higher level of uncertainty era? And here we're seeing the, the Trump election period globally was when we, when we uh, actually hit a peak higher than the big spike that you see in Brexit. So these are kind of the things that you would expect. The Eurozone, double dip concerns, and the global financial crisis. So this is what's happening in terms of the global uh, landscape for policy uncertainty. And so this is, this is affecting the mindset of, of Canadian uh, investors and domestically. And if I overlay now on the global chart, US financial markets, so this is the VIX, this is the volatility index of, of equity markets in the US. Uh, the interesting thing that I see is that on the one hand, you've had a lot of concern about policy uncertainty in the media and maybe in the mind of investors, but 
in terms of those investing on business side, but in terms of the equity markets, you've seen price to earnings ratios have been pretty high. You haven't seen a lot of movement until the last month or so where there were some concerns about some insipid pressures of let's say wages or inflation coming back in the US. Uh, people worried about that or people worried more about whether the, the tit for tat tariffs uh, between China and, and the U.S. would actually amplify and that that would spill over and have bigger impacts. So that's one thing you've seen sort of U.S. financial markets until mo more recently, there has been a lot of uncertainty, but they haven't really been pricing a lot of that in. Um, here is another part where I think the Canadian story relative to the U.S. story is, is, is instructive or interesting. The red line here is the same index for Canada and the blue line is the same index for the U.S. And so it, interestingly enough, things that are happening in the U.S. are having a bigger impact on the Canadian side of things, at least in terms of uh, what's happening in the newspaper. So when you look up uh, our business news, things are very dire and a lot of headlines about NAFTA, for example. So in, in the most recent period in, uh, in January, there was speculation that the U.S. may be withdrawing uh, from, from NAFTA. There were concerns that there was a, a World Trade Organization case, so Canada had brought a case against US trade, use of U.S. trade remedies, and there were, there were worries that Canada might be kind of preparing for, for any and all eventualities. So that's at a point where we had very, a uh, very uh, high spike of, of uncertainty in Canada, and that's what I think is, is restraining some of this, this idea where capacity is at its limits and demand is there, but we have people sitting on the sidelines kind of, kind of waiting uh, to, to jump in because they're not entirely sure what's coming down the pipeline. So the turn from investment is obviously related a lot into Canadian trade policy or Canadian trade environment, so let me get into that. I talked about Trump and Trump's tweets, so I'm on Twitter a lot and I like to, uh, to follow his tweeting. And uh, this was the one that I think was the, the, the tweet that was heard around the world, I suppose. Uh, we, had, we had the idea from Trump happening early March uh, when we had steel and aluminum tariffs that, that trade wars were good and they were going to be easy to win. Uh, this is a sort of example where if you follow things too closely, we have to take Trump seriously and we need to sometimes take him literally, but we don't have to overreact to everything that he does in terms of every tweet. Um, but this was one where we were obviously interested as Canada is a big producer and, and seller and purchaser and buyer of, of U.S. steel aluminum. Uh, this was something that we followed closely and the idea now that we're moving more towards uh, the U.S. and China is something that, that people are keeping their eye on. So I see two main bad lines. Uh, battle lines drawn in terms of increased U.S. protectionism under Trump. The first is essentially we've got um, the Trump administration and the U.S. political system versus North American supply chains. So companies, multinationals have really benefited over the last 10 or 15 years. We talked about labor arbitrage so that it may be cheaper to produce goods and services in Mexico uh, versus producing them uh, north of the border or in Canada. We may be able to provide good parts and services from Canada. And so companies have, have been able to increase their profits and increase their reach by distributing their, uh, their production processes across the globe and, and within North America. So we're seeing NAFTA as the very first point of that where the U.S. is trying to uh, essentially modernize the rules of NAFTA, but also rebalance this deal so that things are really made kind of more in, in, in the U.S. favor. That's the first one to keep an eye on, but the real long game we see is, is going to be the let's make, make America great again, America first from Trump's uh, position, and the longer run made in China. So at some point, and we're seeing the, the negotiations beginning now, uh, this is going to have bigger systemic impacts. So I had to show this chart because this is, this is for you from a Canadian media source. Um, <laughs> It, sa it says, take that China, it's got Trump sort of shooting a, a, a cannon in terms of the trade war and, and the lawyer pointing out that this is actually Canada. So the idea here is that for Canada as this small open economy, that whether Trump is aiming for China and whether that's a long game or whether in NAFTA he's aiming for Mexico, we're involved and we're, int we're intimately uh, related here and the shocks that are happening there are gonna be having some impact on us. And so I just thought I would show that one for you. So on NAFTA, the first, the first battle line I talked about in sort of North American free trade agreement renegotiation point, we really are at this week at the kind of crunch time. So if a deal is going to be both, both agreed to in principle and then um, uh, gone through legislation in Mexico and in the US and in Canada in 2018 and this year, it, it seems as though it's gonna have to happen uh, soon, and I haven't checked Twitter since I started my talk, but I don't know whether there's any news on that, but I'll assume that we haven't yet agreed in principle and that this agreement is, is negotiations are still taking place. And the reason for this, I think, is pretty obvious, as everybody knows, that the Mexican elections are, are underway and, and coming up July 1st. We have the U.S. midterms, the idea that uh, Congress may change its, its shape and form, and so if we want to push, and the, the U.S. Trade Promotion Authority expiring, so there's just a lot of things conspiring to make things more complicated and more difficult. And so so if 
We can make some progress on this rebalancing, which is US auto rules, dispute settlements, sunset clauses, some very, very big things that are looming out there that have not been resolved. Uh, by my count, we have about, let's say about 10 chapters of 30 chapters in NAFTA have been, have been wrapped up uh, and put to bed. And that's some of the uh, easier things that I think, I think people have wanted to modernize for years. So there still is a lot, a lot of work left to be done. Uh, but at EDC Economics, our expectation is that we will eventually get a deal. The question is just sort of, when is that going to happen? Will it happen uh, soon? or will talks essentially drag out for, for some period of time? And in 2019, my chart is updated and we're, we're right back here at the start saying, okay, what's, what's the uh, electoral cycle looking like or, or what are the, what are the uh, timelines that, that need to be put in place to get a deal there? So the, the poll that I have for you today will be what's gonna happen with NAFTA. We've got possibility for positive resolution. We could have an agreement in principle very soon. That could happen in the next week or so and that's kind of the timeline that uh, USTR is, is pushing up to. We could have a positive resolution, which is more where I'm at, where I think that talks will probably drag into 2019 before we get there. And then we could have negative. It's possible that we could not get an agreement. And it's possible that we could just have one of the parties, the US or others, um, threaten to or try to walk away from that. So how's the room feeling about that? And I have five minutes left, good. Uh, positively? OK, so people are thinking that, there's, that NAFTA will, will be resolved and that this is something which is going to take some time, but uh, I don't see a lot of negative votes, let's say 18%, 20%. Okay, all right, I want to hit back to my slides. So in Canada, uh, the US is our main market. We export three quarters of our exports from Canada go to the US. And so over this period of time, we've seen a relatively subdued contribution coming from uh, the exports and net export side to real GDP growth. And interestingly enough, there's been a shift in what we see in terms of how Canadian companies involved in multinational and regional supply chains are, are serving the U.S. market. So this shows the share, as a share of GDP, Canada's exports to the U.S. in red. So before the recession, it's running around 25%. It fell, and it hasn't really recovered. It's more or less been stabilized ever, uh, ever since. We've seen a bit of an uptick, but not too much. And again, I want to emphasize here that this shift is happening before Donald Trump won the election, before Donald Trump came in. Uh, we have seen in the blue line, this is Canadian outward FDI, so Canadian companies investing in the U.S. And so the sense that we are getting now, and this is happening through detailed case studies, look at the auto parts, so auto, auto manufacturing, uh, look at forestry, look at some other detailed sectors where we see that rather than setting up shop in Canada, producing and exporting, some of these firms are either moving or thinking about going inside that fortress U.S. and selling directly to consumers uh, and businesses that way. And so when I think about U.S. trade policy and the administration and what they're doing, I like to, to sort of separate this out into two types. What are the shocks here? There's two kinds of shocks. There's first the tariff changes. So whatever we get in NAFTA or whatever, whatever things are happening on sort of sector specific remedies. So steel and aluminum, we've, we've had some, some movements there. Uh, we've had some mov movements on solar panels and washing machines. The back and forth $50 billion uh, China versus, versus the US lists. Um, so there's the tar there are actual tariff changes. But the part I focus more on at the start is having a bigger impact that we think is sort of affecting mentality now and, and mindsets now is this uncertainty, this higher level of uncertainty about the fact that we don't know, we know right now that there is NAFTA 1.0, but we don't know what NAFTA 2.0 will be and we don't know when it's gonna come into place. So this uncertainty about policy. And I think that's having a different impact on our trade as it's having on our investment. So on the, the trade side of things, there's the existing plants and people that have been shipping across borders and they're more or less we, we, do, we do a survey as well of about 1,000 exporters in Canada twice a year uh, through our trade confidence index. And what they're telling us is that they're not overly concerned. So most firms are just kind of carrying on about their business, but there's about 7% of firms that are really worried that things are, are having a more negative effect. Uh, they're following things closely. But for the most part, we have kind of trade carrying on. We look at the high frequency data. We don't see much of a move in Canada-US trade beyond seasonal patterns and, and uh, um, auto shutdowns and things like that. So existing trade is carrying on, but in our survey, we're picking up a trend of future traders. So Canadian current exporters or ones that want to start exporting to the US market, that has fallen considerably. So there's less interest or less, um, less Canadian export capacity over the long term if that's to be sustained. So we're, we're hoping for that resolution of NAFTA soon. And what we're seeing on, on the investment side, as I mentioned, on the one hand, with higher levels of, of uncertainty, this, there's this hesitation. And that's happening in Mexico, obviously, and that's happening in Canada on the outsides of the US border. And there's this idea that there's a bit of a migration within North America. 
so that some of the investments that had been made, let's say in Oshawa and Ontario on uh, auto plants have moved to the, to the southern, uh, southern states and are moving into Mexico. Uh, so there's, there's a migration within uh, North America. I'm gonna go talk about monetary policy uh, relatively quickly, just to sum up that the economy now after the shock is, is back to its potential and inflation uh, is back to its target. So the Bank of Canada targets 2% inflation. So we're more or less back. And so the question is what's happening with interest rates? In, in, at, at Canada, given that we're kind of where we want to be and inflation's at its target, well, we still have quite stimulative rates in Canada. And uh, we're slowly but surely normalizing those rates. So let me show you the chart here. You see the reduction happening in 2015 after the oil price shock. And then we are following the Federal Reserve, but we are following more slowly. And the two reasons for that, as I mentioned before, is mainly this uncertainty about trade policy and NAFTA and the concerns about consumers' indebtedness and the housing markets is they don't want to increase rates too quickly uh, because that could be a problem to, to slow the main contribution to growth coming from those areas may, may slow things more. So to summarize where we're at, there were some key risks that we had this shock in 2017. Maybe this momentum that we're seeing is real and things will continue and that will grow. But there's also a downside to the upside risk. And it's possible that US growth will exceed. We've seen an increase in uh, fiscal stimulus coming down the pipeline. And those markets that were relatively sanguine, if they start seeing inflation or wage pressures, they may uh, increase or re reprice some risk. That will have term premium effects, which will go throughout the economy, but also in Canada. Uh, and that could slow things down. The biggest downside risk that we see is obviously the more aggressive uh, and, and more protectionist U.S. trade policy. And I think, again, of my two, my two parts of, of North America, I think the bigger concern is, is whether or not uh, there can be an accommodation between China and uh, between the U.S. on, on their tariff uh, exchanges. And so to conclude and wrap things up, in terms of what we're seeing in the global economy, it mirrors in large part what's happened in Canada more recently. So six, since 2016, uh, global growth has strengthened. It has been improving, it's been spreading uh, across the globe and in Canada across, across regions, uh, and it's been surprising on the upside. We have a similar story to that, although the difference is that our, our outlook for the global economy is for it to improve and so growth to go up. And in Canada, given the reasons I described to you before, we see growth kind of slowing from 3% down to about 2% or so. And uh, the big risk that we see is, is going to be what happens uh, this side of the border and trade policy. So you can find me on Twitter following Donald Trump there or contact, uh, contact me. Thank you, Stephen. Relatively upbeat, I suppose. Um, although, just to point out, I did vote for all the negative uh, answers on those three poll questions. Um, the interesting thing, actually, the, the, the spike in, um, in fear, I suppose, after Trump was elected, then coming down, and we've looked at a lot of this, I'm sure you guys have as well. It just basically seems to me that for the first year, people increasingly got comfortable with the idea that Trump wouldn't actually do what he said he would because he had lots of allegedly smart people around him and they've now all left and he's now doing kind of what he said he was going to do. So it's all spiking up again. Um, I also didn't realize that you had the fastest job growth in 10 years in Canada, which actually, I suppose Trump doesn't either because otherwise he surely would have taken credit for that as well on Twitter somewhere. But um, if he has, I'm sure you could tell us because you would have seen it. I don't subscribe to Trump's Twitter account, but I do guiltily look at it on a far too regular basis. Okay, uh, let's have a break. Uh, let's say 15 minutes. Let's be back here sort of 4.15, 4.20-ish, and we'll get started on the second half. <laughs>